everybody. Today's Thursday, the 10th of December, of September. That was wishful thinking, right? I was putting us to the holidays. Um, okay, so if I could have your attention up here, I have a feeling we're going to power through a lot of stuff. And um, my goal is to make sure that your needs are taken care of. How good is that, right? All right. So does anybody have anything they need trouble, they need help with, they want to share? Anything. Yeah. I was just wondering if I did it right this time. Do you want us to look? Um, I mean, you can. Is it on the forum also? It should be. Okay. So you're, you're asking about the last activity, which is analyzing an ad. Yes? No. Yes? No, the, the one that we that was due today. Uh, oh, okay. We'll get to that. We'll share. I mean, the the um, the okay. sketches, the yeah, yeah, thumbnails, and then the layouts. It's and it, no, that's not due today. No. Okay. It's. <laughs> are y'all panicked? You said have them done by the next I did, and you listened, and you're the best. It was it was a very strong suggestion. <laughs> <laughs> Let's see when it's due. Let's see when it's due. Let's see when it's due. The window for it closes. Let's put it that way. It's due on Monday. Okay. So, but um, you uploaded it. It's there. Well, did you upload it? Can I look? Do you? There's two people who uploaded. Pardon me. I don't think you could upload it. You don't think the window is open to upload? I don't think so. Somebody did. I tried. You can upload it. You can upload it. Well, I put mine as a JPEG, so maybe that's why I could. Uh, no, no. Oh. Yours is uploaded. But we're going to look at Paul's because he asked. Okay. And. Pardon me? What did you say is due on Monday? Monday is, you know how we worked on those little sketches over there and then we did grid layouts uh -huh. and scaled things? Okay. It's due on Monday. And. I don't like this new interface with. Uh... I was having problems with like the PDF thing. Okay, well let's look. You know, um, I want to compliment you, just whether you had trouble or not. I want to compliment you with the fact that you are fearlessly putting yourself in front of the class to get critiqued, and the best thing you can do is put yourself in front of the class to get critiqued, because we learn from each other's mistakes, and you can still correct your mistakes. So, so like, bravo. That's actually, that's, come on, you guys. Yeah, big thumbs up. Okay, so thank you for that. Let's, um, let me just, let me op see if I can open this. Hang on. I just want to open this with Acrobat. Come on, let me open it with Acrobat. Open. Not in browser. I think you have to go to the folder and right click it. Yeah, see, I did something wrong. No, you did nothing wrong. It's just I want I just want to be able to download it and I can't download it. Right click it, he says. No, no, you had to go to like, show oh, the folder and then No, it did that's my point. It did not it did not open. It should be in our downloads folder. Let's see, there it is. There we go. Bless you. Mobile link is off. Okay. It's making me crazy. There you go. I don't like this new interface here. Okay. So you made sketches, you made thumbnail sketches of your ad. Did you put your ad in this? Um, yeah, the next page has the original. Okay, so here's your original the, ad. The, 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 we worked off of the So this is your ad. They're not different, yeah. these no, two. No, the last one, the last picture is the original. And then, oh. and then I was messing around with the wording and the size and okay. stuff like that. Okay, okay. All right, so this one at the bottom right yeah, is your ad. that's the original. Okay. This is making me crazy. 
I don't, I am new page controls to tool. There you go. Okay. Um, okay, so let's come up here. So, yes, you scanned the ad well, or you downloaded it well, you placed it in InDesign well. Yes, you did grid layout sketches um, by drawing a grid, but basically, you really kept everything as a centered layout. And because the ad has only, unfortunately, the ad is pretty limited. It's a pretty limited ad. It's got a logo, one line of type. I'd love for you guys to find ads that have more text, more body text. You have nothing to work with here is kind of my point. It's really frustrating to work with something that has yeah, so few elements, which was my frustration with that uh, Jaguar ad we did. So my suggestion to you, just by looking at this, is you maintain what you did differently is you scaled the ad, you repositioned the tagline and the logo, and you scaled the logo, but everything stays centered. I was trying to put, like, you know, like maybe put it off to the side. Yeah. And like, and, like, have it, like, get blown up, but off to the side. Right. And stuff like that. But then, then I was looking at the video that you that I was talking about and how, like, the placement with the, the grids and stuff. Yes. And then it seemed like there was just a lot of white space off yeah. to the side. as like, it was, like, yeah. just clumped. Um, you it was know, working with this one, I guess. So, well, it's not, you know, a learning curve is, it's not the easiest ad to have chosen, to be honest. It's not the best. Neither was that Jaguar ad I picked, but I got frustrated. In front of you guys, sometimes I get frustrated when I'm finding something, and, and I don't want to make you wait while I look for something. Um, Roxanne, you posted yours, right? Yeah. Can we look at yours and critique it, too? Sure. Do you mind? No, I don't mind. We'll applaud you too. Okay. Okay. I'll okay. Do it for the applause. Okay. <laughs> okay. Good. So, just back to you, just to finish up, Paul. I would, I would appreciate you doing another one, get credit for this one, okay? But do an additional one that you add to it, where you have more elements. And let's look at Roxanne's and see if hers maybe had more elements to work with. Um, thank you for letting us do this, Roxanne. You, you didn't know you were gonna do that, did you? Now, it should be in our downloads folder. There we go. There we go. Okay, so here's your original ad. Let me, let me close this. Okay. Wow, I opened a lot of windows, didn't I? There. Here's your original ad. So you started with a bouquet, um, and the bouquet is shaped like a brain, right? And it's coconut, is that coconut water? It's, yeah, like. Yeah. Kind of yeah. Okay. Smart water. Type. Smart water. Coconut water. All right. And so you took the layout and you here took the shape of the graphic and you moved the headline on top of the graphic and you put the tagline down besides the bottle and moved it. So you created an asymmetrical design. It looks white, right hand weighted. Yes. Then up above you created a centered design and ran the tagline to the the right. Come on. Yes, sir. Were uh, all of them supposed to be hand drawn? Um, my request was I want all of you to learn how to sketch out thumbnails. And my extra special request was after you do that, I want you to learn how to scale things and move things around with a grid layout and in design. So mm -hmm. to make me ultimately happy, because that's all about me, right, is to do both. Thumbnail sketches and InDesign layout. So that's my request of you. The assignment, in all honesty, asks you to either do it by hand or do it on the computer. I'm asking you to do both because I actually think it's an easy assignment. Really, do you, don't you guys? Yes. Yeah, I think it's an easy assignment. So I want you to get uh, comfortable with both um, working by hand and. Um, and working digitally. And then what you did was you took your graphic, you blew it up, you moved it off the page so you cropped it, and you flopped the alignment of the bottle and the taglines and put a headline up here. So you did some sketches, which is great, all great. Um, so Paul, back to you. So notice this is, so here, this is a centered layout with the tagline, I don't know if this tagline's going to cross. I'm not sure what you're doing with the tagline, actually. It's uh, kind of a centered layout. 
Yeah, it was centered, and then I wanted just the end piece to be a little the bit tag. off to the side. So if we were to look at this in terms of a grid, we have a three-column grid. One, two, three, and the tagline's in the third column, maybe, maybe, yeah. centered, and that spans all three columns, right? If we look at this one, it looks like I see grid here. Yeah, there are grids. They're just really hard to see. Yeah, they're really faint. So here, your graphic breaks the grid, but it takes two columns, and you let it off the side. You span the two columns for your headline at the top. Am I getting that right? Mm -hmm. And you span all the columns here for your tag at the bottom. Yeah? Did I do that without right? Yeah. So now let's kind of look at your layout. So yours remained centered the whole time, and, and you were losing track of the grid. And mostly because when you're centered, when everything's centered, you're basically using the entire page and spanning all your columns. Do you understand what I'm describing? Okay. And we could try this again, because I think it's an important concept to get. Did you? Oh, you didn't do the digital yet? No, not yet. Because you will. Yes. Okay. That's great. So that was great. Thank you for sharing that. That's perfect. Okay. Would you guys like me to demo that again? Raise your hand if you want me to demo that again. That's a few of you. You got to get serious about this. It's kind of a majority rules kind of thing. Do you want it demoed again? That's a that's a. Oh, now you're indecisive. Okay. Let's try one more time. Should I demo that again? Raise your hand, please. Okay, that's a fair enough amount. I'm going to try and go a little more quickly because I want to demo grid layout again, and I'm going to demo grid layout. Because your next assignment, almost everything is going to require grid layout. So understanding it is really valuable for you. And how many of you are still struggling with InDesign? Go high. Yeah, OK. I want to make sure you get your arms around InDesign, because the whole semester InDesign is where you're at, OK? Just so you know. Um, all right, I will demo it again. I just want to, I will get so to it. That one, I just had a question. Like, it seems like uh, for the Jaguar edit for this one, we're mostly just moving elements around. Like, uh, would we be able to like rotate? And I know we flipped them back and forth, but like rotate or spin them in a or just rearrange them like that, or do you want to kind of keep the same uh, orientations? I do not care if you change the orientation. Okay. I don't care if you rotate, spin, turn upside down. I do care that you use a grid layout. Okay. Okay, that's what I care about and get comfortable with it. You know, what, I, what I'm going to do here, all of you just hang with me, because even if you know InDesign, I'm hoping you won't be bored to tears. Um, <coughs> OK. Everybody just take a look up here. I'm going to walk you through, again, InDesign. And I'm going to take it beyond the scope of this ad and this exercise. So those of you who didn't need help understanding this gets value out of grid layouts in a larger perspective. Okay? So I'm going to take this further than the ad and revisit grid layout. Um, actually, let me back up. I'm going to pause a second. Um, I will demo, and I'm going to come back to it. I don't want to demo right this second, but I will come back to it. So I will demo grid layouts. I will demo scaling objects. I will demo um, how to work with different elements. And again, who understands paragraph style sheets? OK. So I'm going to demo a lot of InDesign today. And, and my goal is, I hope, to give you guys some class time to get some things done. OK? Does that work? All right. What I, what I also notice is, um, so this week I, I, all right, I'm all over the place. Let me, let me slow it down. Let me slow down my brain. Number one, I apologize. I asked you all to bring in your design element pages, and I didn't, we didn't share them on Tuesday, so I apologize. Did anybody happen to bring them in today? Okay. Can you bring them, that's fine, I didn't ask you to. Can you bring in your pages on Tuesday, and we will do it. And John will remind me, or you guys will remind me, please. So bring them in. What pages are you talking about? You know how you're doing the design principles book with cutting things up and pasting them on a page? Oh, 
Brooks, you don't know about this because you didn't watch the first video yet. But you will watch all three, which exist, and then you'll know exactly what we're talking about. So Brooks, um, if you look at page, uh, the home page in Moodle, right up here, there's an assignment called Complete a Book for the Principles of Graphic Design. And it's based on a series of lectures, which are also found. Let me back up. So back to the home page. If you go, I think it's in week two. This link called Design Principles. There was a far more wonderful teacher than anybody I know who developed a mini course in what's called Design Principles based on all the principles of design. Alignment, unity, scale, proportion, static, dynamic, and so forth. Here is the entire curriculum for that assignment right in this PDF here in week two called Design Principles. And you're going to create a book following these exercises. These exercises go actually, I think, down to like 30-something plus pages. I don't carry them that far for you. Um, you end up taking about 16 pages. This it, is like a physical book? You're it's a out. physical book. Um, it's due at the midterm. You need to plan on how you're going to bind it. You need to think it through. Does anybody have a question about it who was here for the lectures of it? Oh, good. OK. Um, um, Emily. Yeah, the first few pages, yes, please. We're just working with black paper squares. Yeah, we did have a very long conversation about what's okay and what's not okay. All you really need is a square format. A lot of you have come in with a page that's eight and a half by eleven, which is not okay. So a square format means a square format. Could be four inches by four inches, sixteen inches by sixteen inches, twelve feet by twelve feet. Square format. Square. Yeah. If so, if the binding. And is it inch? Okay. So mine is nine and a half by eight and a half. Oh, there you go. Is that okay? Yes. Okay. So, Brad. Okay. Brad's comment was, "I have to leave space for my binding here because I've thought ahead." Good job. My page format is square, but I have an extra inch here for binding it, whether he's going to sew it, whether he's going to put eyelet punch holes through it and grommets, whether he's going to screw it together with posts and bolts. I don't know how you're going to bind it. Whether he's going to take shoelaces and weave it. OK, but the area, the live area is square. And it's a physical thing. And your question was, should it be black and white? That's perfectly fine. Some people got super excited about expanding it out to something incredible, like Kelly, who has silk screen prints of lobsters. Yeah? Yeah, not silk screen. Yeah. Looks yeah. silk screen. Just like super simple prints. Of potato lobster. prints of so lobsters. <laughs> <laughs> Do you guys remember potato prints? Yeah. No? When you're in kindergarten, you take a potato, they cut it in half, they carve a square on it, and you dip it in paint, and you make little squares everywhere. You guys didn't do that? No. You did that. Brendan knows. Yes, you did. So she, so she. Real live lobsters. She, so she made. Because she, with her watercolor thing, she said she with her kids, like, kind of abstract thing with the watercolor. I had done made these little prints a long time ago and so I just did watercolor on the prints and made a bunch of kind of like watercolor lobster print pages and I'm going to cut them up. It's not going to be like a lobster. So you're making, okay, so the design on the paper is going to be different but you're still cutting off squares? Like, yes, out of whatever whatever pattern. It has to be square. It has to be, wait, are you talking about the pages or the, the boxes? That the page has to, to be square. Oh. Don't jump the gun here. Don't jump the gun. There are three lectures where we discuss that you can watch the videos. You might have missed the first one. I think you did. Um, OK, hang on. Let me get to the assignment link for it, which is right here, called Assignment, week one. So again, you can read through this, but this tells you what to do. There are about 16 pages, or I think there's a few more total. And they each address a design principle. 
the first set of design principles you're looking at in exercise 1A and 1B, which totals two pages. A, B, 1, A, B, okay. One is static. If you play something on a page and it's vertical and it's static, right, you don't feel movement. If I tip this, your eye perceives movement, which would be dynamic. And what you're trying to do is create a dynamic relationship between three elements, which happen to be square. And they have to be square. Mm -hmm. okay. Just follow it. Right. Don't turn this into brain surgery, okay? I'm do exactly what I was doing. But don't position them how it shows. Okay. Position them your way, okay? okay? And the reason I physically want you all to do it is the act of physically placing elements on a page is a very different process than digital. And we're all so tied to doing everything on a computer that I think it shuts down our brain, personally. I do. I think it locks us into something. And the act of physically moving things, I think, becomes more exploratory and kind of, you know, it's, it's the act of physically doing something, hearing it, seeing it, touching it, doing it, all those things reinforce it. And then you take it to the computer, you know, with, um, with your work as a graphic artist, but not for this assignment. Who else threw up their hand? Nobody? Did I answer it? Yeah? Okay. Um, so, Brooks, you're going to have to listen to these videos, which you might not know, johnlemon.info, right here. John has maintained for us a series of recorded lectures, which is we're recording right now. So if you don't know what the heck I'm talking about today, or you kind of like fall off the cliff, you can come back here, you can scroll down to our class 114, and there are, John has posted all the lectures since class began. So if I demo something in class, I mean, I understand the talking is tedious to do, listen, re-listen to in, lec in the lectures on YouTube. They're on YouTube. They're on John's page here to access them. But you can scrub through them. And, you know, for example, last week, um, if I play this, let me make it quieter. So, um, it's good to see all of you. I hope you all had a So you can scrub through it and remember what we... There we go. Is that you, Sam? Zoom in. You can see that the guy was tied to a chair. You're famous now. A little red blood spot right. coming down. So, right. what's that? Internet famous. Internet famous. So, the value of this is you, if you are in class and you're saying, okay, I don't need to do that, but I do want to see the demo, did I demo anything? There we go. We demoed the dandelion ad, and then we wanted to see how to quickly do InDesign layouts. Then you can scrub through it and find what you want. Yeah? And that's the advantage. OK? So you can listen to the description of this book that's required of you. JohnLemon.info. OK. OK, OK. Um, so back to what our point was, which is Tuesday, please bring in those pages. And here we go. All right. Um, we're now in your book on typography, your textbook, your quizzes on typography. Have you all gotten to that yet? It's the next one. It's the next one. You haven't gotten to it. You haven't looked at the chapters yet. OK. So one of the things I noticed about in week three is all of your lectures in week three, like I said, this class was designed as an online class, so all your resources are here. Um, all your lectures are on type and typography and so forth. And it's really tedious if I go through those with you. You can do it on your own. But what I will try to do today in talking about InDesign and working with type is I'm going to give you a little crash course in typography with it real fast, OK? I'm going to try and just grab it all in. Good with you guys? All right. 
So we'll demo the grid and we'll talk about type through InDesign. The next thing I want to do is I do want you to come prepared on Tuesday having read through these, which is talking about designing for mobile devices. I think what I'd like to do um, is we'll talk about the design for mobile devices on Tuesday when we get together. We'll talk about the project because it's a, it's a bigger project than these little things that you're working on, which are, you know, it's a more complete project. And you have, you should get a jump start on it because I think it's due at the end of next week. All right. And I want to give you some resources. You're going to de design, there's an assignment where you have three or four choices for mobile, designing a mobile app, where you're going to find original artwork. You're going to take a layout, which is the size of an iPhone, and you're going to design for that device. Okay? So small format. And you're going to use artwork and understanding, which is why I want to demo so much in InDesign for you, understanding how to place graphics, how to work with type, how to create something that's clear um, by using InDesign or Illustrator or Photoshop. Um, I want you all to get your arms around that, okay? And I, I don't feel prepared right now to talk about it. I'm just introducing it. There's that link, Designing for Mobile Devices, and there's a second link, which is called Hints for Designing on Mobile Devices, which we'll talk about. But the assignment, which is here, which is you have a couple weeks for, is you're going to create a mobile game design, again, designed for a phone. And it includes steps along the way, which we're going to critique together and improve on and discuss in the class, which is creating thumbnails, which you're doing with this little exercise we talked about today with the ads, yeah. You'll create thumbnails. We'll talk about your layout and your thumbnails and we'll critique it. Then you'll take it to the computer and we'll look at your progress and we'll critique it and to make it better. Critique as in support you to be your most excellent self, not critique as in cut you down, okay? The idea is to make it better and make you feel proud of it until you get to your final design, which is going to show up in about three weeks. So we'll go step by step. Yeah. Are we supposed to use our own art? Well, that's a really good question. You know, I, I read through it and it says you're supposed to create original art. However, then it links you to all these um, free vector sites like I showed you at Vecteezy. So the point is, is Yes, you will create your original layout and original artwork if you like to create artwork. Otherwise, you, as a graphic artist, need to know where to find the resources to create appropriate art for what you're designing. So either which way. If you happen to be an illustrator, which some of you are, um, I look at this class because it's a more advanced class. I look at this class as the as the place for you to create work that you would put in your portfolio to show a potential client or a design school just how fabulous you are. So I want everything to look just that fabulous. Even if you're not going to be a designer, even if that's not your future, it would be really nice to have professional looking work under your belt. And that's kind of the level I want everybody to get to. Yeah, right? Why not? Okay. So look ahead at the assignment. There's a few choices for games. It says, um, let's see, here, choose um, from the following smartphone games. And the reason why I don't feel prepared is I don't know any of these games. Do you guys? Hank Hazard, Drift Mania, Dune Rider, Tunnel Shoot, Giraffe Matching Zoo, Stop Those Fish, or Lion Pride. Are those real games? No? So we'll poke around, poke around between now and Tuesday so you get your arms around it. Unless they're just pretend. I, maybe they're real games, I'm not sure. Is anybody in here designed an app? Have you? Kind of. What was your app? Uh, we were like five people and we designed a game. And you designed a game. Yeah. And if you want to take that yeah. and tell me it, what happens as a part of this, look here, this will help you. You're also going to have to write a critique of, of this game, this application. What's the name of the game? What does it do? What are the goals? How do you win? 
what age are you designing for? So these might be pretend names. They might not be real games, which is probably now that I'm thinking about it more accurate. But you have to think it through. What's the goal of it? Um, what's the point of your app? What's the point of your game? Okay, so that's going to be part of it, right? In the summary, the synopsis, the overview. Okay, who's your market audience? Who would you promote it to? That defines your color palette. It gets very complex when you design something. Okay, so look ahead a little bit. Um, any questions on that for the moment? We're going to start, we're going to visit this all on Tuesday. Okay, then where I want to head from here again is yes, I will create a grid layout right now in InDesign. Yes, I will find an ad and do a layout and show you different ways to lay it out and think about it. We'll start with some very specific elements. And in doing so, I'll also talk about type and using fonts and typefaces in InDesign. Does that work for everybody? OK, you guys got patience? I'll try to stop by, um, you know me, I'm out of control usually. I'll try to stop by 2-ish, 2.15-ish. Um, and that way, hopefully, you'll have time in class to ask John and I any questions. Does that work? OK. All right. I'm going to turn off the light. Is that better for you, or leave it on? Off. off? OK. So um, First thing I'm going to do, I'm going to pause the video. Well, I'll keep it going. I know John will tell me why would I pause it, right? But we're in your Gmail. That's why. I have to log out of you. How are you there? Let's get into me. There we go. Images. Drive. So I, on my Google Drive, created an images folder, basically like you're doing. And I created a folder of public domain images. And I'm going to download randomly, randomly download these. More actions. Download. There you go. Preparing to download. I'm going to download those so we have 10 images to work with. OK? All right. <clears throat> and now I'm going to go into InDesign. And again, for those of you who are new to InDesign, I'm going to launch InDesign. And again, you can determine your InDesign workspace. And I'm going to go to, let's say, my printing and proofing default workspace and show you again how to set it up and the things that I like to work with in my workspace. Actually, I'll go to typog typography. And I'm going to reset typography. And for my workspace, I like two columns because it's easier for me to find my tools. It's easier for me to find my fill and my stroke box. I always end up working with paragraph style sheets, which show up in typography, and character style sheets. Um, my swatches show, my color shows. There are two tools that I always use, which is one is Window, Object, Layout, Align, um, and Pathfinder. I love both of these tools. I find I use them all the time. So you can drag your panel over here, and you can just snap it into your side panels in InDesign. It works the same way with any Creative Cloud software. Okay. And um, the other thing I make sure of when I start any document is that my stroke off times this stroke is black. I'm sorry. This stroke is black when you start a new document. Make sure when you start any document the stroke is not black. Because every time you draw any box, a text box, a box, or a graphic box, it'll be stroked in black and it'll make you crazy. You'll have to undo it all the time, which is frustrating. So I'm going to fill that with none. The other thing I do when I set things up is I go to preferences. And I set up what measurements I work in, which is usually inches. And so usually the default when you first launch the program is PICAS. PICAS is a measurement they use for um, magazine ad layouts, newspaper layouts. But I'm going to leave it into inches and say OK. And right now, I can create a new workspace. 
and I'm just going to call it Victoria. I'll know it's my preference and I'll give it a date. And that way if I come back to this and I make a mess out of it, I can always set it up again. And now I'm going to make a new document. And the default, you can work with the new document window. I hit Command N for new, sorry. Um, or I went to File, New, Document. And this is our new document window. We can determine whether we're going to work in print or web or digital publishing. When we do a mobile game device, we'll work in digital publishing and locate an iPhone, right? That'll be our page default for our design. But today, we're going to do that magazine ad, and I'm just going to go to the print intention, intent. And I don't want facing pages. Facing pages is a book. When you open things, it's called a spread. Two pages facing one another is a spread. And if anybody has a question, feel free to interrupt me and slow me down or call me out on something, okay? So I'm going to turn off facing pages because we're going to make single page layouts. When you build a document, I want you to become accustomed to always adding an eighth of an inch bleed, which helps create guidelines for you when a graphic extends beyond the trim of a page. The default margin in InDesign is a half an inch, and I find that a little too predictable for my taste. I tend to like really large margins. Um, so I'll just design mine at, um, I'll design mine actually at 5 eighths of an inch. And notice my chain link is set here, which means all settings will be the same. But if I break my chain link by clicking on it, I can make um, my bottom margin, let's say, a little higher. And um, I'm ready to go. So here's my document with its bleed. Come on. It's also the preview button in the bottom left, so you can see the changes as you're yes. making them. Yeah. Did everybody heard that from John. Yeah. OK. Now, here's my document. I um, want to make sure nothing got zipped up in my downloads folder. Open and finder. Here we go. Okay, so all my downloads were zipped up, and I'm just going to drag them to the desktop so I can find them. Those were all um, my Google Drive images, which I'm unzipping. Okay, and then you'll see in here is all those images I had. Okay, so when I create a grid layout, there's lots of ways to do it, and I'm going to slow it down, and I'm going to show you a couple ways. InDesign does what Roxanne did. She drew those lines just like that grid video gave you, right? That's what I saw you do. I'm not crazy about that grid video, to tell you the truth. So um, it is a great introduction to grid layouts. And if you are in InDesign and you want to create guidelines like that grid, you can go to Create Guidelines. And we're going to turn on the preview box that John was talking about so you can watch what we do. And we can make a three column layout. Can you see the blue line showing up? And notice that the guides are showing up based on the page. But it looks really weird. Why is it doing that? It's the gunners? No. It's a three column layout, but these are not equal columns to here. It's really weird. Four. Yeah. And it's based on, notice it's based on the page, not the margins. You want to set it to the margins, which means your columns are now based on that column guide from here to here. That well, I know. It's just odd, though. Um, and then we have gutters. And gutters are when you read a newspaper or a publication, your text does not touch each other. The space between those columns of text is called a gutter. And the default gutter in InDesign is very tiny. I would never have a gutter smaller than a quarter of an inch. And I tend to be a big gutter girl. <laughs> so um, you're going to have to just use your own judgment. You can also create in InDesign 
um, let me eliminate the gutter for my rows and you could create rows right now to divide your page into thirds okay and these are just guidelines for you I tend to never divide my page into rows personally but it's a quick way yeah Sam so how is our are these got these are just guides that they're different from the ones that like if you go to layout uh, columns that are like set up margins and columns yes I'll show you that one in a second okay yes good question yeah these are guides and the reason why guides might be valuable is Roxanne watched that video that was on your assignment which said which said take your page and divide it by three columns and three rows right Roxanne mm -hmm. there and that's exactly what you did exactly but if you had columns of text it wouldn't give you the gutters for your columns of text it just broke the page into like segments into a grid okay so Sam, that was a, a good question to ask. Now, I tend to infrequently use guides, honestly. I, there's a very specific times I use it. So I'm gonna cancel this. What I do tend to do is what Sam brought up is go to layout, margins and columns. And I use this all the time. Um, you set this up when you created, let's just close this window, command W, don't save. When I made my new document, you look right here as um, John said, I can turn on preview right now and you can see what I'm doing. And I can set up in my setup of my document three columns and adjust my gutters at the onset, right when I first start designing. I can do that, right? And then I broke my chain link. And that's going to be basically my page default for this document. And that's on the onset. Again, add a bleed just so I want you to be accustomed to it. And here, it's the same thing we were looking at. Okay. How are the columns different when they're in purple as opposed to the, the teal that we were looking at before? Oh, that's a good question too. Um, when you're in InDesign, you can go to Preferences and you can go to Guides, Guides and Pasteboard, and you can make them any color you want. So my margins can be in dark blue and my columns can be in violet and my bleed can be I really like fiesta I'm just going to stick with fiesta I'm just curious if there's a like, technical difference in if you set up the column as the <laughs> origin of columns or as a guide um, no there's okay. no technical difference the truth is is um, these are these don't really sh they never print yeah. unless you ask them to they're a guideline one of the things you can do in um, grids and guides is this. I recommend you setting this up, snap to guides. You know when you take a box or a graphic and you move it close to a margin guide and it just kind of sits in there, kind of pops in there? That's called a snap to guide. It really helps. It helps in your layout and so forth. But there used to be, in the olden days, and God, this is so olden days, you guys, in the olden days, there used to be a color called non-repro blue. And so if you, wrote, if you drew, um, let me make my columns. You might not even be able to see it. Um, grid blue. Let's try that. Um, so my columns are now in this light blue. There used to be a, a marker called non-repro blue, where if you put it on a copier, a flatbed copier, it wouldn't pick up the blue color. If you, before there were digital files, you used to have to photograph film of your artboards. And when you'd photograph the film negatives of the artboards in order to make printing plates to print from, big printing, um, not digital printing, all your guides would be drawn with non repro blue. And I'm only throwing that in there because then it mattered. Now it's just kicks. Now it's just history. Now it's a color playground for you. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Okay, so one of the things Sam said is, can can I change um, the margins and columns here? Layout margins and columns, and the answer is yes. I set them up in my creation of the document, but now if you look at the bottom of my margin, 
I'm changing it, right, to one inch on the bottom, or I'm changing the number of um, columns to four or five. So you can see that you can change it with whatever page you're on and whatever page is active. So let me set it up like this, and let me save my document because I've gone to a bit of trouble right now. And I recommend you save immediately once you really have set something up. And I'm going to call this Grid Demo because that's really what we're doing here. Um, and I'm going to put it on the desktop and put it with my document folder of all my graphics and save it. Okay, so now I want to show you. So I think everybody who's focused on your computer should focus up here because I think nobody in the class understands paragraph style sheets, and this is your opportunity. Okay, so we're going to talk about type right now, which is something new for most of you. So if I could have you all focused up here with your computers asleep just for a moment, that would be fantastic. So in InDesign, everything requires a box, a graphic box, a text box. So I'm in my type tool. I'm going to click and drag. I'm going to create a text box that is three columns wide, and I'm going to fill it with placeholder text which is for the purpose of demoing. You'll use it to dummy things up. Placeholder text is often called Greeking. Greeking would be when you draw lines of type. And um, this is Latin, not Greek, so go figure, right? But I'm going to zoom out, Command-0, which shows me actual page size. Now, this is what I want you to understand. Yes, sir? How did you get the, the text again? I'm hitting Undo, Command-Z. Now I just have a text box, my cursor is blinking, I'm in my type tool, mm -hmm. I went to type, and I filled it with placeholder text. Right. Okay? And it fills the box for you. Now, I want to just show you very obviously there's, in InDesign, there's what's called a character control panel and a paragraph control panel. And if you run your cursor over it, I don't know why it's not popping up right here in the upper left but that should say character formatting controls next to the A. And next to the B, it should say paragraph formatting controls, but it's not. I'm not sure why it's not displaying. This P is the same, the paragraph formatting controls, is the same as type paragraph this panel right here, right there. So all the tools that are in this panel are the same tools that are in this panel when the P is active for paragraph formatting controls, okay? Now, in, same thing, character formatting controls, same thing, this character panel right here I can tear off, I can double click on it so it's open, and all these tools in here is the same as when this A is active with all the control panel up here. Everybody get that? So you don't always need these little side panels that I pulled off, but I'm going to show you anyway. Now, when you set type, I have some rules about it. So I'm going to zoom in um, here so you can see what I'm doing with type. Come here. There we go. All right, if you hold a space bar, it'll grab your page like you're moving a piece of paper with your hand, grasping it, okay? Now... With a type tool active, the T, I can select all my type. In order to change type, just like if you're in Word, you have to have your type active. Your cursor can't sit next to it. You have to select your type. So you can, just like in Word, you can double click on it. You can triple click on it and get a whole paragraph. Or you can hit Command A and get Select All. Or you can go to Edit, Select All. Okay? All right. So with my type active, I can choose my font, and you can either start to type the name of a font like Times um, New Roman, Times New Roman Regular. That's the type, and the default is always metric kerning. Kerning means, watch this. Kerning means I'm going to make this type really big so you can see it shift. I'm going to change this type to 24 point in my pull down menu. Kerning is the space between each letter, letter to letter. Okay? Metric kerning is the default, which means all this type has its own little metric space equally measured out for the letter. 
but that doesn't always make it pretty, like when you put the letter V next to the letter A. If you want to kern them not metrically, let me make them over here, let me cut them out, command X, let me create a new text box and put them over here for you and make them 72 points, which is an inch tall. So these are metrically kern letters. They each have their own specific space. If I select them and I optically kern them, the space between the letters, they tuck closer to each other because those slants look prettier closer to each other. So if I take all this text in this text box, select all, command A, and I optically kern it, watch it shift. It all kind of tucked into something. It's just like if I took the letter T and lowercase o and I metrically kerned them instead of optically kerned them. You see what happens? Okay? So where that's going to matter to you, it's going to be very significant in large amounts of body copy. You just allow it to optically kern, which is the default. I mean, which is not the default, but easy to set. And the other time it's going to matter to you where you might want to adjust it is if I select this and I optically kern it in a headline and I might decide that I want that O to hug the T a little tighter, right? Like your headline says, cling to me, right? And I put my cursor between the two letters and watch I can tighten the kerning between the letters. Okay, and you do that visually as a graphic designer. That's the difference between mediocre art and great art. Yeah? Okay. Is there a time when we do not, absolutely don't want to use optical kerning? Oh, such a fabulous question. You're like my plant. It's perfect. Yes, there's a perfect time for it. Um, okay. Okay, that is an op those are two phone numbers optically current. And I have made this mistake in my life before. So you see, you get to benefit from all my great mistakes. So I don't think it looks good. I, it bugs me. Like, why is one phone number with the same amount of characters longer than the other phone number? That bugs me. It just bugs me. Like if you have phone and you have fax and you have... Um, cell phone and you have, right? Who wants this jaggy bit of numbers? If you change these and you metrically kern them, I just feel so much better already, right? Doesn't that just make you feel better? So for me, that's one of the times. There's also weird fonts you'll download off of um, uh, free font websites. And the fonts might be designed to be only attractive metrically kerned because they're a scripty font or something like that. So, like if it doesn't work right and the kerning's funky, try metric versus optical and see what the difference is. Okay? Any other questions about that? Now, there's a difference between something called kerning, right here, where you see the slash between the two letters, and something called tracking. Tracking is, I think these phone numbers are hard to see and read. So if I track them, I can universally open up the space between the characters. I can select this entire paragraph by triple clicking and I can change the tracking and open it up to make it more readable. Sometimes it's overkill, sometimes it's not. Sometimes if you have a tight font, you might want to just track it just a little bit. Okay. Um, now, something that I'm absolutely, um, what's the word, vehement about, is you never create type that has what's called um, automatic letting. The default letting, so as Chris told us accurately, letting is Chris. What's the space in between like, lines when you return, or you're typing a paragraph, it's the space between the bottom of the characters and 
Perfect. Perfect answer. The space from that baseline to that baseline is called letting. And Ellen, what what does the word letting come from? Do you remember from back in the old machines you pressed or you used bars of Yeah, letting. Yeah, exactly. And Ellen's exactly right. In the olden days, when you'd use character by character, sort by sort, remember that one? Right? You missed the good one. What happens when you're feeling out of sorts? Right? What's, you know what that phrase is? I'm feeling out of sort? You ever heard that? Uh, kind of funky? Right. You know what it comes from? Who wants to tell her? Out of words. You're out of words. You're out of letters. Sorts is a character, and you put your characters in a letterpress box to build an article. But when you run out of letters, you're out of sorts. Cute, right? Okay. I love that one. There's a video on that one if you guys ever want to see the video. It's really cute. Um, okay, so baseline to baseline. So never use default letting, which is in InDesign 120% of the point size of your type. Always set your letting. Always control everything. So with 24 point type, if I use 24 point letting, it's super tight, right? If I want to space it out, you might use 36 point letting and it becomes far more readable and breathable. All right, everybody get that? All right. The other thing is <coughs> alignment of paragraphs. So in the paragraph palette, this alignment is referred to as flush left. You guys all know this. This is centered. This is flush right. This is justified, which means it goes column to column. Goes column to column. And the software spaces out the words between those columns so it works. So it's flush on each side. This is called, let me see. Let me zoom out a bit. And let's look at this box here. Let's hit a hard return. Right here. There. That's a hard return. So this is, and let's make this the end of our paragraph of the period. <laughs> okay. So this paragraph is now justified. This is called justified centered. Look, what, look at the bottom line. This is justified right. And this is called forced justified. Look at the bottom line. It expands it out. And if you had only that many words in your, oh, that didn't work very well, did it? Oh, I see what I did. And you're, if you're in force justified, look at how poor that bottom paragraph looks, right? Because you've forced all that space between the lines. So that's um, paragraph alignment. I know that's not news to you guys. Now there's other things in this paragraph panel which you might just have fun exploring, which is by selecting this paragraph, I don't have to select the whole thing to apply, um, to apply paragraph styles, to apply a paragraph control to it. I can put my cursor anywhere in the paragraph, and what I do will apply to the whole paragraph. So right here is... Um, this is called space before. So let me let me select all this. Let, let me make it like 12 point type. Oops, 12 point type on let's say 16 point letting. Let me get rid of that force justified type. Let me show you hidden characters like paragraph returns and so forth. And let me select all my type. Let's get rid of these phone numbers. And um, let me select all my type. And I think that's a big block of type. It's crowded, and I think it's hard to read, right? And I have multiple paragraphs in here. I believe I do anyway. Let's, uh, there. So I think it's tight. So if I select all this text, go to edit, select all, 
I can add space before my paragraphs or space afters and it universally changes it. What I find most students do is they most students when they want to control their space between paragraphs as they hit a hard return and they go to the next paragraph and they hit a hard return and the next paragraph and they hit a hard return. How many people do that? Fess up. Okay, good. Now, you don't want to do that. You want to control everything. So an easier way to do that is select all and go to space before and there's space added before each paragraph and you can control the amount of it. And it's universal. So you could do it universally. Imagine creating a book that's a zillion pages and having to hit a hard return after every paragraph. That'll make you crazy, right? So you want to get practiced at space before and space after. You know what it is because there's a little bar on top of space before and on space after there's a little bar at the bottom of the paragraph. Okay? So I'm going to hit space after and increase the space after and it's just whatever style you like. There's other controls in here which are really fun which is I can control a paragraph panel. Again, I'm just going to do my opening introductory paragraph panel and I can add a drop cap to it by um, increasing how many lines deep I want my first letter to drop down. So two lines, three lines, four lines. That's a drop cap. Okay. Sometimes nice effect for body copy where you want an introductory to a chapter. The other thing is um, the other thing is you can also control the number of characters you'd give that drop cap. So I could make it five characters long, or, yeah, five characters long, and make my first word as long as it's a five character one. Um, be the drop cap the same depth. Okay, kind of fun. What else is there? Uh, you can indent a paragraph right here. This is your indent, left indent. And the advantage of that, again, is you're controlling it. You're not having to tab over every line. You can also write indent it. Let's say you have a special pull quote or something you want to call intention to and you want it indented. So you can do that. I'm going to turn these into zero and make this into a page that looks better. So let's say, let's say this paragraph is a quote and I decide to make it times italic. And I decide because it's a quote, I want to indent it to make it look special. So I indent it on the right and I indent it on the left. And there's my quote. Yep. And let's say in InDesign, in the paragraph panel, I want a line above my paragraph and I want a line below my paragraph. I can go to this pullout menu and I can locate a paragraph rule. This is a crash course, you guys, right? And I can turn a rule, remember, is the same as a stroke or a line. Same thing. So if I turn, I'm going to go to preview. John. Yes. Yep. And I'm turning my rule on. Look what happened to my rule. It showed up above my paragraph. I can offset it, put it above my paragraph. And I can make it the width of the column or the, the width of the text it sits on. And I can use my pull down and put a rule below. And I can turn my rule on. And I can offset it so it looks a little better. And I can make it the width of my text. And I can say OK. And then I decide that because my quote's so important, I want it to be bigger. So I'm going to make it 14 point on 24 point letting, right? And I'm going to select all my type and add space after my paragraphs because I didn't add enough to make me happy. And now I'm starting to create something that actually looks like a page of formatted text, yes? Okay. And I don't like the space below my pull quote right here. So I'm going to click anywhere on that pull quote paragraph, the italic one, and add more space after that paragraph to create some breathability. Yeah? And I'm going to add a little space before it to add some breathability. You guys all follow what I just did? Okay. Now, this is what I want you to understand. So, 
we've gone over kerning, we've gone over tracking, we've gone over changing point size of type, we've gone over the letting, space, baseline to baseline, we do not distort, let me just tell you my pet peeves, do not change the scale of a letter. If I want this G to be really tall, I can change the scale of it like that, but I think type is sacred. An artist designed the type and the artist designed the type to be beautiful just the way it is. So would I take somebody's artwork and stretch it and say, oh, it has to be taller? No. You go find type that's a condensed font or a taller font. Don't distort a perfectly beautiful font, okay? Find the appropriate font. Same thing, you know, don't <clears throat> expand your type if you want extended or expanded type. Locate a font that's called extended or expanded. My pet peeves, because some artists design this type to look beautiful just how it is. So that's my, it's my agenda, okay? Now, so we've created this document. I'm going to save it, <coughs> Command S. And are there any questions before I move to paragraph style sheets about alignment? Yeah. Just another note on what you were just saying. There's also that other one where you can create false italics. Oh. And we don't you, ever want to do that. Either. You know what? I don't even think you can do that anymore. Oh, you can do this. This is what you're talking about. Yeah, you can slant the type. Make it oblique. You can make it, right, oblique or italic or whatever. And That's if the like. Designer didn't create it in italics, then right. don't force it. Yes, don't force it. It's painful. Don't do it. There used to be, and it doesn't <coughs> happen anymore, there used to be in, I don't know, in InDesign where you could click an I button and italicize something like you can in Microsoft Word. And what happens is if, if Times Roman doesn't come in italic, then the computer won't know what to do with that italicized font that doesn't come in italic and it replaces it with a replacement font. Totally screws everything up. Thank you. That's called styling a font. Don't style it. Find the one that's just how you love it. Gil Yerma, was that a question or yeah. no question? Yeah. Yes. Um, I still don't understand what's the difference between carding and tracking. Okay. Good. Good question. So I'm going to select all my type and I'm going to make it flush left so you can see it. Okay. So here. So kerning is really simple. Kerning is where I put my cursor. Is it easier with my boxes or no boxes? No boxes, right? Kerning is where, right here, I put my cursor between two letters. That's it. And right now I'm going to tighten up between the V and the A. There. They're really tight now. <laughs> They're on top of each other. Okay? They're kerned. The space between them is negative 700. You see okay. that right there? How would you want to use that between just two letters? <coughs> Kerning is just between two letters. Okay. Tracking would mean that I would select this entire paragraph and I would open up the space between all letters and all words. Okay? Mm -hmm. See it? Yep. Until it blew its own mind. <laughs> okay. So I rarely track something unless I feel like it just needs, like a font is just a little too tight and not readable. I might take it up to 10. Or you might find that you have one line of type and you want a line break without a um, hyphen. And I might track that one line tighter than the rest just to get it to fit on one line without looking awful. Do you prefer no hyphens? Well, you know, it's a really great question. Do you prefer hyphens and no hyphens? When you have um, a lot of text here, let me show you. I did not turn off hyphens in this text. And what happens is, is when you go to, let me go to our grid so you can see our grid. And when I make our columns of text narrow, two columns, um, and the point size of type is big, you can get zillions of hyphens one after the other. So there's a time and a place for hyphens. Um, it's really a... In typography, she wouldn't let us do hyphens. Who, who's uh, your teacher? 
and Anna. Yeah. Uh, and she says no hyphens. Yeah. Yeah. And no widows or. or and no. Okay. Oh, such a good <laughs> question. Okay. I mean, a good comment. So I don't know if like. Okay, so, um, Brad, is asking about hyphens. What do we think about hyphens? You can control hyphens in InDesign magically. It's really quite wonderful. Let me put these away here. I can click anywhere on this paragraph and I have two consecutive hyphens and I can go to type. Let me see if that's where I'm looking for it. You can go to the paragraph. Yeah, it's not here. Okay, so I can go to my paragraph panel right here. So I can go to type pull up my paragraph panel and there's a pull out here where I well first off I can turn on and off hyphenate so if I turn off hyphenate for this paragraph they go away but now I get a really ragged line side right all right the other thing is is when you justify type so let's double click anywhere here and justify our type look at how many hyphens I have by justifying the type trying to make it fill the line lengths and look what happens to my type when I take hyphens off of it. Then you get something, these are called rivers. Like you just feel the little flow between. Those are called rivers. And then Brad just asked about something called a um, widow or an orphan. That's a widow where you have this one little teeny word hanging at the end of a paragraph. And an orphan let me show you about an orphan. Orphan's quite tragic. Um, so an orphan would be, if I take this text box and I make it that height, and I get this red symbol, which means I have text overflow, and I click on it with my black arrow, my cursor, my mouse, my selection tool. There you go. And I create a text box right here. You see this little lonely person here? That's an orphan. So what I would do, for example, is I might decide to track my line tighter to eliminate a widow or an orphan. How did I do in crash course on typography? Was that good? Yeah, I was just curious. Now you don't have to take Anna's class anymore. <laughs> oh, it's on video. Sorry, Anna. <laughs> I already took it. What's that? I said I already took it. Oh, you already took it. Okay. But I, I just know you personally if like you would grade off like um, for, I would for I would call team. attention to it. Yeah. Would I grade off of it? Or I would like call attention to it. Meaning if it doesn't work, then um, I would say, gosh, is there a way to highlight this text right here? So let's say our um, let's say our paragraph jumps like that. Okay? That's you could totally see that happening, right? So then you say, what am, what am I going to do? So I might select that whole paragraph, go into my tracking panel up here, and tighten my tracking, and that took care of business. Yeah? One problem is, of course, if you go in and edit it, somebody changes the text a little bit, then it all gets... Yeah, what John's talking about is the 75 times I have to revise something. So, right? Yeah. Now, let me tell you the magic reason we use... Um, Paragraph style sheet. So, any more questions about characters or paragraphs or? Okay. So here's the magic part. You're gonna love this. You guys are gonna love this. All right. First off, I'm gonna make my page um, layout six columns because I want to. There we go. <coughs> and <clears throat> I'm gonna make this first column three columns wide. The snapping to guides. And I'm going to make this one three columns wide. And I'm hitting um, object fitting, fit the frame to the content. Notice it created space. Yeah? All right. Now, you sat with me as we controlled all these paragraphs. So here we go. If I put my cursor anywhere on this first introductory paragraph, and I go to paragraph style sheets, I have nothing commanding this paragraph to behave like that ever again. But if I go to this little page at the bottom, which is to create a new paragraph style sheet, or I go to this pullout and I create a new paragraph style sheet, 
I get this window popping up. And I'm going to call this intro paragraph, okay? It's not based on anything because I haven't designed anything yet. And notice what it did is it picked up all the controls I already gave it. We had 12 point type, 16 point letting. The thing you'll recognize is my drop caps are four lines deep and five characters wide, right? You recognize that now, okay? So if I say, okay, let me just come back here, and I create a shortcut key, which is my command button and the right hand keyboard, number one, I've got a smart key that designates it. If I put my cursor anywhere on that pull quote with the cute little rules and lines above it, and I go to my paragraph style sheet, and I create a new paragraph style, and I call it um, quotes, right? And I'll put rules next to it so you remember it has a line above it. And notice if I go to paragraph rules, my rule is on. It's a certain color. It's the width of the text, right? You go to the font, it's italic. It's got the letting and tracking, right? Okay. And then if I go to my body copy down here, all the rest of the text, and I create a new paragraph style sheet, and I call it body copy, which is the bulk of what my text is going to be. It's got my 12 point letting, it's got my optical kerning, it's got my um, left alignment. I'm going to balance lines so when it's left aligned, um, it's not ragged like we looked at that. Look how ragged this one is down here, down at the very bottom. You'll see it change. Not yet but you'll see it. Okay, now, nothing has been commanded to do anything. We just monkeyed with this together. So right now, if I click anywhere on great, that paragraph, I designate a paragraph style sheet. That's my intro paragraph. Nothing's going to change because that's what we formulated that paragraph style off of. If I click on quotes and I do quote rules, nothing's going to change because that's what we formulated it. Now on the bottom of this page, here all the rest of this is my body copy. Wait a second. Let me select all the way down to the end. And if I apply body copy, what? watch how ragged that edge goes and how it balances. And I go to body copy, there we go. See how it evened out my paragraphs? That's balanced ragged lines. Now, what I want you to see why we love paragraph style sheets is pretend this is a book and every chapter of the book starts with this paragraph, which I think should be not justified because everything else is ragged. So I'm going to go back to, I'm going to click off of things. I don't want anything active by mistake. If I go to intro paragraph and I change my alignment, my indent and spacing from left justify, let's turn preview on John, right? you got to remind me. If I go from left justify to left, watch what happens with the top left paragraph. There we go. If I change my character color on my drop cap, let's see if I can do that. Oh, I can't change it here. I have to create a different, I don't want to get too complicated. But let's say I want my intro paragraph to be a new font. I don't want times, it's kind of boring. I want it to be Helvetica. And Look what happens. It became Helvetica. So imagine having a complete book, a million pages long, all in Times Roman, and your client goes, you know, I don't really like that font. Can you just change it? I want to see four different varieties. Imagine how easy it is to show them the revision. It's just a little quick stroke. And you say, OK. And now let's say I want my body copy to match my intro paragraph and I want to change that to Helvetica. So I change it to Helvetica and off it goes. Yeah. And let's say I decide that I want all my lines on my pull quote to change. So I go to my paragraph style sheet and I go to my paragraph rules, for example, and I don't want them black. I want them red and I don't want them one point I want them really significant and 10 point. And I change the same on my rule below. I want it red and 10 point. 
And this is why you do paragraph style sheets, because they control everything. Okay? So that's your super crazy fast lesson in typography in InDesign, so you understand all the controls. So before I shift to grid layout and working with graphics and layouts, does anybody have any questions? No? Okay. Good. Um, I'm going over, but I'm going to do my grid layout anyway. Can you guys hang in with me for it? Yep. Okay. So here's our intro paragraph. I'm going to change that to one drop cap just for kicks um, and then move on. So one. There we go. And two. And okay. All right. So now this is what I want you to see about um, layouts. So let me get rid of, actually let me just get rid of these two paragraphs here. There we go. And now we got body copy. So, and let me make a headline. Who, want, who wants to give me a headline? Oh, what, what? <laughs> I didn't hear it. I was going to say man bites dog. Man bites dog. I didn't hear the other one. Did I miss something good? <laughs> okay. And here's my headline, and it's impact, and it's no paragraph style. Let me do that again. Impact, and it's 72 point. Okay. And I'm just going to keep everything black and white here. So here's our headline, and I'm going to keep our grid layout. So this headline can, in other words, grow larger. So you can make it grow by hitting the percentage sign, which is to scale it. You can hold the command option shift key down and scale. Whoops, let me do that again. You got to hold them all down at the same time and scale it that way. Or you can just open your text box and double click on all your type and just increase your scale incrementally, incrementally in the character control panel. Okay? And then you can obviously create your body copy here. This is one column wide, which is really narrow. You can't really get many words in. Two columns wide. You can click the overflow box and align them and use only two of your six columns for your body copy. It's still a six column grid, but we've still, um, we've left a lot of white space. The other thing is, is I can, for example, let me just do this kind of quickly for you guys. I can create a graphic box right here. Actually, let me hit undo. And let me go to file, place. When you place a graphic in InDesign, you don't paste it you place it so it's linked to your original graphic. I'm going to find the graphics I downloaded and I'm going to select six of them. So that's three, six. My cursor is going to load with all six images. It's going to say six. And I can make them right now one, two, clicking and dragging, three, four, five, six. Okay, these are, these are not very attractive images, are they? But that, if you look at that, is a very orderly layout, right? Whether you like it or not, it's got order to it. The other thing I can do, for example, is I can, let me just shift a couple of these aside, and I can choose this graphic right here and go to fitting, object fitting, and I can fill the frame proportionally, fill the content proportionally, and that didn't do it, it fit it proportionally. I want fill, fill the frame proportionally, there. And you still look at this 
and you still recognize that I've got a, a six column grid layout, right? There we get that. Doesn't look very good. I probably move this guy over. I probably move that over. And I've still filled it proportionally. I might decide that I want this to sit up here and this to sit here and this column of text to go here. And I'll use my other two columns right here to fit my grid layout, right? Or I might decide that because my boxes are flowing, it's going to flow into the last box as I shorten this one because they're all connected to each other. Then I can do something like um, delete that column of text, delete that, put my headline in these two columns if it fits. Doesn't really. So I'd have to select all, Command to A, and reduce it till the word bytes fits. Right? Or you can, um, I'm going to cut this out, Command X. That's still a six column layout. I've just taken my graphic and it bleeds the whole way. I can paste my text in and choose this right here and make this three columns of text wide and three columns of text wide. It's not very readable because it's a pretty busy background, but you get the idea, right? Yeah, Brad? Do you do baseline grids? Can you baseline grids? Or like, do you always do them? Do I always base align them? No. I mean, I don't know. I'm going to leave the rules to you and what you like, and then we'll look at them and we'll critique them. But again, it's still a six-column layout or a two-column layout, depending on how you look at it. But you guys get the idea of how you can scale and create the columns to guide it. Is there anything that you want me to show you um, that I haven't shown you? Okay. Then that was a lot of talking for me and you. Um, so we did have a little overview of typography. You're not going to need paragraph style sheets for your little one-page ad. But I recommend you get familiar with them because ultimately you're going to create a brochure as your final project in the class and you're going to really want paragraph style sheets. So we're going to refer back to this video because it was good, right? Okay. Um, any other questions about type or grid or setting up an InDesign document? Okay. The only other thing I want to show you is somebody asked me before we left last week, maybe it was Jay you asked me, you said, do I want the InDesign document or just a PDF? Did you ask me that? Somebody? Uh, no, I asked you. You asked me. I asked you if we needed to use packaging. Packaging. I have everybody packaged for a very specific reason. I created a nice layout here. I don't know when I'm going to come back to it and where my stuff is going to be, my fonts, my paragraph style sheets. One more thing I'll show you about paragraph style sheets in a second. but. So right now, I'm going to save my document and I'm going to package it so everything goes into one folder. You will never turn in your InDesign package unless we specifically ask you. You got to make sure that nothing's missing or modified. This using RGB color space for printing is not ideal, but let's say it's a digital magazine and that's fine. And I'm going to package it so I keep everything um, together. That's instructions if I need to send anything to anybody. Um, and then it takes my document name and adds the word folder. And then for Paul, who's using an old version of InDesign, this will automatically save an IDML document, which is called InDesign Markup Language, um, which lets an old version of InDesign open this. And then you want to include a PDF, usually high quality. This you can just leave this as your default for the moment. It doesn't give us things that are going to matter like bleeds and so forth, but I just want you to see this. And that says don't steal the fonts. And now it's going to package everything together. All those little photos, so it'll take a while. The little teeny ones I moved off to the side and didn't use. And here's my document. And if I save this and I close the window, I'm I've got my grid folder of the document I just made. Here's the document. 
Here's the PDF of the document, which was that one page. There you go. And, um, and then you'll also see that it copied all those photos, oh, which was only the one that was in the live area copied, and the fonts I used. Now, paragraph style sheets are good for something else, which is why you're going to want to use them for every term paper you do in the school. Here's the fun part. If I make a new document, and I'm sorry, if I make a new document in InDesign, and I say, okay, there's my new document. And let's say you get a super cool way of organizing your term papers. You have a chapter header, you have a place for your footnotes. Like, I don't know how strict the teachers are for this stuff, right? But you need them, yeah? You got to have a format, most teachers. They want page numbering, yes? Okay. I can take this, I can get my paragraph style sheet, I can load paragraph styles, it says where are your paragraph styles, I was like oh I really loved the styles I created here in the grid document, I say okay open those babies, it says well which ones do you want, I say I want them all, they're all checked, okay and I magically now have my format, yeah are you like so excited right, is that the best, coolest, okay the other thing is when you're in InDesign there's something called master pages and then I will stop talking I promise master pages these are set up as facing pages if you go to a master page and you take type and you put it at the bottom here actually I'm not going to be small about it I'm going to make make it big so you can see it and yeah we'll leave it we'll leave it small and I'm going to center it let's say and I'm going to go to type and I'm going to insert a special character which is a marker which is the current page number and I put it there and it says A because it's a paragraph style sheet A and I'm going to make sure this is centered between my margins and I'm going to hold my option key and my shift key and duplicate it to this page and then I'm going to come to this page and it's page one and I'm going to my page panel I'm going to insert 12 pages 12 pages and you'll notice can you guys see that at the bottom I have a page 2, page 3, page 4 it automatically numbered my pages okay which is pretty nifty yeah I know you can do it in Word but everything's so pretty in InDesign and you can put graphics in it alright so that's my little sideline for paragraph style sheets so when you are submitting your work, I do not need this entire folder. You're just going to upload your PDF document. However, if right now you did this in class and you wanted to go home with it, you would take this folder when you're in Finder on the desktop. You can go with, it, with this folder active. You can go to File, Compress the Folder, and it becomes a zipped folder right here which means it's one file to upload, let's say, to Dropbox, because otherwise Dropbox only uploads one file at a time, but now that's all compressed and it's one file. You, you can upload directories too. You could upload? Directories. Directories. And you could upload a whole package. At the same time. In Chrome. You can just drag the Oh, you can't. Oh, in Chrome. Okay. Okay. Any questions? Okay, so, yeah. Is there anywhere on these computers that we can just keep files in there and we can access them from any of the OSX computers we log into that are like that's tied to our pipeline accounts? No. Um, I was trying to think because you have a specific, I mean, Lori's right. Because you, I was thinking because you have a specific login. But if you have a specific login on that computer, yeah, it might be on that computer. But people randomly do things. It's different. It used to be that you didn't have to log in with your name on a computer. So anybody could delete files and add files and monkey with files. But you guys, every time you sit down, have to log in to the computer, don't you? Yes. Yeah. Yes. So if you... Wouldn't trust these things. Yeah, I was going to say, I wouldn't trust them. Like, don't think it's a sanctuary for yourself. Yeah, but you um, can, like, well, just like the Windows computers have a... Has a network drive that you're always. Oh, yeah, you have no, you know, you right. don't have that. You don't here. 
and don't trust it. Some days they'll just wipe everything off a computer because something was weird with it, or yeah. it's I don't have control over it. Um, that was a good question. Anybody got any other questions? No? Okay. So um, use, you've got 40 minutes. So use the time to gain some ground or ask John and I questions about InDesign or anything you want to ask about. Bring in your principles of design pages next week. Um, you will be completed by the time we come on Tuesday with your two projects, the Analyzing the Ad project and this little prototype. And I'd love for you to do more than just sketches. I'd love for you to um, try it in InDesign, too. Then try and find an interesting ad. Okay? All right. So have fun. Thanks for surviving all that chatter.